Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us as we gather to discuss free speech, white supremacy, and insurrection. We're delighted that you've chosen to spend some time with us this evening. My name is Maeve Dubois, and I am the Associate Director of the Walter H. Kapp Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life at UC Santa Barbara. And it's my delight to welcome you on behalf of our Programs Director, Professor Greg Johnson. Before we begin this evening, we want to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of California is located on the unceded lands, ancestral lands and waters of the Chumash people. We would like to call your attention to two upcoming events here at the CAP Center. The first will take place the day after tomorrow, February 11th at three o'clock in the afternoon Pacific Standard Time. We will discuss protecting sacred land. Featuring activist Suzanne Schoen Harjo, who is past president, past executive director rather, of the National Congress of American Indians, and Professor Michael McNally of Carleton College. The event is the second this quarter in our symposium series, Ethics in Place, Indigenous Peoples and the Future of Principled Democracy. And on May, sorry, on Monday, March 1st at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we will welcome Dr. Felicia Cohn of the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. Dr. Cohn will speak with our own Professor Greg Jarrett on death, dying, and medical ethics in the age of COVID. That event for which we will have our advertising out very soon is part of the CAPS Forum on Ethics and Public Life, Public Policy rather. So please watch your email for that advertisement. I'd like to take a moment to thank our many co-sponsors for tonight's event. The Assistant Vice Chancellor and Dean of Student Life, the Blum Center, on Poverty, Inequality, and Democracy, the Center for Cold War Studies, the Office of Civic and Community Engagement, the Multicultural Center, the podcast Straight White American Jesus, the Taubman Symposia in Jewish Studies, the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. Our heartfelt thanks to all of you. In addition, we thank our student assistants, the incomparable Alma Louisa Mendoza and Madden Westland who do wonderful work for us. This event is live streaming on Facebook and we are recording it as well. The video will be available soon on our social media networks and on our website at capcenter.ucsb.edu. Further, in something of a departure for us, we have compiled the list of resources that we think may be helpful to all of you, whether you be educators or you just want to read more yourself or you want to engage in, in meaningful conversations with others. So we've compiled this list of resources and they are available um, on our website capcenter.ucsb.edu on the announcements page. So to tonight's topic, as we all know, four weeks ago on January 6th, 2021, violent insurrectionists stormed and laid siege to the United States Capitol in an unprecedented act of domestic terrorism on American soil. The event was all the more distressing and dangerous to our democracy in that it was prompted and incited by the sitting president of the United States. 
He, of course, was subsequently impeached by the House of Representatives for the second time. And today he stands trial in the United States Senate for the second time in a year. The violence of January 6, while perhaps not entirely surprising, was nonetheless shocking and breathtaking in its ferocity and its scope. We now know that the insurrectionists not only sought to disrupt the electoral college certification, but that they came perilously close to reaching the lawmakers whom they hunted and whom they hoped to assassinate. It is clear that we came within a hair's breadth of witnessing the decapitation of the legislative branch of our government, the consequences of which we can only contemplate. Many observers have noted that a striking aspect of the events of that day was the apparent sense of entitlement that the insurrectionists displayed. Overwhelmingly white men and mostly unmasked, despite a raging pandemic, they were clearly unafraid of being identified or of being met with significant resistance. In addition to violently attacking others, they brazenly spoke, they brazenly posed for photographs, menaced police officers, replaced the United States flag with the campaign standard of their failed presidential candidate and with the Confederate flag. Others flashed the, the well-known gesture of white supremacy. While white supremacy is nothing new in our nation's history, in fact, it may be said to be foundational, the Trump insurrection exposed the very real danger posed to our democracy by this ideology. A brief review of the nation's recent history exposes the prevalence and power of white supremacy in the American body politic. Here are just a very few brief examples. Members of the KKK famously marched through downtown Washington, DC in 1925. And indeed, that is the United States Capitol in the foreground of that image. In the 1960s, Arizona's Barry Goldwater and Alabama's George Wallace exploited racism and white backlash for personal and electoral gain. So too did Richard Nixon, most famously through his Southern strategy. And you didn't have to look too far at any Tea Party rally during the Obama years to recognize the overt racism and white supremacy that drove that movement. White grievance has been stoked by countless politicians and demagogues. The unstoppable and undeniable demographic shift that is reshaping the American elected electorate lies at the heart of much of the current resurgence of white supremacy in the public square. Our panelists this evening will talk at greater length about the history of this insidious ideology that found its most recent and most dramatic manifestation in the halls of the United States Capitol on January 6th. After brief introductions, our moderator will engage in a conversation with two other panelists, Melissa Bartholomew and Ryan Coonerty. At the top of the hour, we will field questions from the audience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A function on Zoom. We may not get to all of your questions, but we do appreciate all of them.
Our moderator this evening is Dr. Katya Armistead. She is the Assistant Vice Chancellor and Dean of Student Life at UC Santa Barbara. Dr. Armistead has been an administrator for over 30 years, focusing largely on issues related to the quality of student life at UC Santa Barbara. She's particularly devoted to promoting inclusion and equitable access among our students. We are indeed delighted to have her with us tonight. And it is my great pleasure at this moment to introduce Dr. Katya Armistead. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm especially excited to hear from our panelists, uh, two wonderful scholars that have a lot to share tonight. Um, let me share a little bit about them and then we can get started. So Melissa Bartholomew is a doctoral candidate in public history with a designated emphasis in feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She has served as an intern for the Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs, the Dean of Students Office, and the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services. She has assisted with special projects pertaining to free speech, campus climate, mental health services, and crisis management. Melissa has helped lead campus and community responses to the May 23rd, 2014 Isla Vista tra tragedy in which six UCSB students were killed and 14 individuals were injured in a deadly rampage. She has assisted numerous communities around the nation in their responses to mass violence. Her dissertation focuses on memory and politics in the wake of mass shootings. Melissa was a 2019-2020 fellow for the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. For her research project, she created a toolkit for student affairs administrators and university leaders to help them balance demands for freedom of speech and the promise of equal education opportunities. She holds a JD from Golden Gate University School of Law, an MA from San Francisco State University in United States history, and a BA from UC Santa Cruz in United States history. So we're happy to have her. Lots of good stuff there. Ryan Coonerty, really nice to meet him. He is a member of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors and two-time former mayor of Santa Cruz. He's also an uh, entrepreneur, author, and educator. He is currently the host of an Honorable Profession podcast and a lecturer on law and government at UC Santa Cruz. He is currently a UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement Fellow. Previously, he co-founded Next Space co-working and co-authored The Rise of Naked Economy, How to Benefit from the Changing Workplace, and wrote Etched in Stone, Enduring Words from Our National Monuments. Ryan was selected by the Aspen Institute to be a Rodell Fellow in Public Leadership as one of the nation's most promising young elected officials. Ryan graduated from the University of Oregon, received a master's degree from the London School of Economics and a law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. Um, I also wanted to note that Ryan is in virtual residency here at UCSB as a fellow. Just so you know, that's where he's doing his internship. So let's go ahead and get started now that we've learned a little bit about our two panelists. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Melissa. Melissa, are there moments in history that stand out to you as particularly relevant in understanding our current moment and the issues our nation is contending with? How, in your view, how do we get here? Great. Well, first, let me just thank everyone for tuning in and everyone who organized tonight's event. Uh, it means a lot to me to be in conversation with all of you, and I especially miss seeing our students on campus. Just to echo some of what Maeve spoke about earlier in terms of this history of racism in the United States and thinking about uh, anti Barack Obama as president. Um, that's one of the main lenses through which I see a lot of this. Uh, if we think not just about Trump, but also John McCain, who in 2008 
He didn't just attack Obama's policies, but attacked him as a person, portraying him as Muslim, Black, nationalist, uh, socialist, foreign Arab, Kenyan, un-American immigrant, all of those things were being used by John McCain and the GOP. So I think that's an important starting place to think about it as not just Trump and Trumpism, which is the moment we're contending with in a lot of ways right now. Also, Obama experienced a 400% increase in death threats, many of which were racially motivated. And so I think that that is a key thing to hone in on. For me, I see a lot of this as a backlash to having the first African-American president. Um, I also think that the takeover of the Capitol, we can really look through this lens of American exceptionalism and this myth that we have that the United States is somehow unique and distinct from other nations. We see ourselves as this beacon of democracy around the world, uh, being characterized by the acceptance of electoral results and things like that. But we also um, have a situation where the GOP, a lot of people and Bush responded saying, how can this happen? In here. This is what happens in banana republics or third world countries and didn't think that a coup would be possible in the United States. And uh, one thing that we don't tend to read about in our textbooks, but that occurred is that in 1898, there was actually a coup that happened in Wilmington and um, North Carolina. And we have a photograph. Thank you right there. And it's estimated that as many as 60 to 300 people were murdered and that the local government that was elected two days prior was overthrown and replaced by white supremacists. So for our students tuning in, this is shortly after Reconstruction, where after the Civil War, a lot of African Americans were able to uh, vote for the first time, hold elected office, and there was this strong white backlash and response. And so these um, insurrectionists, this coup, the first one in the United States soil, they had 2,000 white men uh, expelling black and white leaders from the opposition party, destroying black run businesses, including the only black newspaper in the city. And that's what this particular photograph depicts. And according to uh, one of the authors uh, that is on our recommended reading list that they put up on the CAP Center, it's a great book called White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. She talks about the ways in which through US history, black progress has been vehemently resisted often by the politicians in charge and how it's not only about visible violence, but actual white supremacy through the courts, legislature, executive branch and government bureaucracies. And so I think that while watching the Capitol live, I was watching TV when it all happened with the takeover, it looks like a made for TV moment, right? With this guy with Viking uh, horns, and face paint and fur. And, you know, but we have to remind ourselves the 800 people who were involved in storming into the Capitol building, uh, in general, the majority were not far right extremists. And, you know, they were not necessarily what we might conjure in our mind of, Cheeto eating older men living in their mom's basement playing video games or this kind of caricature that a lot of people I think kind of gravitate towards, but rather a lot of them were business owners, CEOs, doctors, lawyers, IT specialists, um, accountants, and even recently elected politicians. So I think that's one key thing to hone in on. And then another moment that we can um, do the next photo if you would like to is Brie Newsom, who is a activist and artist who went and pulled down the Confederate flag in front of the South Carolina uh, courthouse. And she did that in the wake of the AME church shooting, the manual AME church shooting that had happened in 2015. You may remember the perpetrator, I prefer not to say their names, but had killed nine parishioners in this mass shooting. And he had really put a lot of Confederate flags on social media and things like that. And so she scaled 30 feet and ripped down this flag. And I think there's a couple of reasons this is important for us to be thinking about. One is symbols have played such a big role in these uh, moments around the Capitol takeover, but also uh, white supremacists in Charlottesville and um, protesting BLM events, right? So when we're thinking about speech, I think it's important to not think about just what's spoken, but also the idea of freedom of expression being embodied in symbols, like on the flyer that we had uh, for this event tonight. And so um, when we think about the Confederate 
statues and flags, a lot of times there's this myth or story that certain people who promote the use of them say, well, that's just history and it's always been this way. But in fact, uh, the courthouse there only erected the Confederate flag in 1961, which South Carolina did for the 100 year celebration of beginning the Civil War. And why in 1961? Well, that was at the height of desegregation, desegregating the schools, and it was a white rage type of backlash against those advancements. Uh, similarly, the Confederate statues that have played such a big role, a lot of those were erected during Jim Crow. They weren't immediately after the Civil War ended. And so uh, it was at a different time where, again, segregationists were trying to intimidate and um, use symbols to try and suppress people. So I think that those are some key things. I see this as um, very much a white backlash as well as issues around um, you know, misinformation, which we'll get to, I'm sure, in stealing the election and uh, QAnon and things like that. Thank you for that introduction. It's going to be a good talk, all. So Ryan, what does the insurrection illustrate about the lines between free speech and in, um, incitement to violence and hate speech? What are the What is that fine line right there? Uh, thank you for asking that question. And before I begin, I just want to take a moment and thank Maeve and Katya uh, and Melissa and the CAP Center and the whole UC Santa Barbara community for sort of welcoming me in virtually uh, for this uh, residency. I do uh, look forward to the day that I can drive down the coast um, and be there in person, but um, it's been really great to engage uh, in these uh, difficult and challenging and interesting times in which we live. Um, to answer your question, I'm going to sort of, uh, I think as Melissa did, try to put this into some historical and legal context. Uh, she did it so well, tracing it back um, really to the origins of the country and, and forward. Um, <clears throat> for the purposes of thinking about where this line is between free speech um, and incitement, and that was, was actually being argued about in the Senate as we speak, uh, during the second impeachment trial of, of Donald Trump. Um, and I'll just put into context that we should all remember that the impeachment process is not a legal process. It's not a court of law, it's a political process. Um, and so um, the normal standards of jurisprudence and precedent uh, don't always apply, but I think it's informative for all of us who are sort of wondering, how does this happen how, how, how does Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani and the enablers around the president sort of get away with this? Um, uh, as Maeve said, this really scary traumatic event um, that really not only put people's lives in danger and resulted in death, but also, you know, um, un sought to undermine our democracy in really fundamental ways. Um, there are really a couple cases that we have to look to the first one being a 1969 case, uh, Brandenburg versus Ohio. Uh, this case uh, was decided by the activist liberal Warren Court. Um, they dramatically expanded First Amendment rights as they did with voting rights and uh, rights of uh, criminal defendants and other, other folks. Um, but uh, Brandenburg was a Ku Klux Klan rally that was being held in a field in Ohio. Uh, it was being taped. Uh, and there was uh, sort of unsurprisingly amongst the hoods and the cross burnings, um, also talk about advocating illegal actions, which meant um, uh, targeting and killing uh, minority groups, uh, Blacks, Mexicans and Jews, Catholics were the, among the targets talking about it, and as well as overthrowing the United States. Uh, they were taught uh, were using armed, uh, an armed insurrection. Uh, they were charged with a RICO statute, sort of the classic uh, conspiracy uh, statutes that are used to go after organized crime. Uh, it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, threw, out the case, threw out the charges against them on First Amendment grounds. Um, saying that uh, speech is protected uh, unless it's directed to inciting and providing, uh, producing imminent lawless action, and the speech is likely to produce such action. And in that case, they found that because they were sort of removed, um, you did not have incitement in that case. So the question then becomes, when we apply it to the J events of January 6th, 
what does that look like? And I think, um, you know, you certainly had uh, Ruggiani arguing for a trial by combat. You had the president uh, are telling people to take action, fight harder. Uh, he was attacking uh, the vice president, uh, Pence. And now as 200 people have been arrested, at least 25 of them have been found to have said uh, that they thought they were being directed by the president to march down uh, the mall. From a legal perspective, it really comes down to this question of eminence. Um, it was about a one and a half mile walk, a 30 minute walk um, uh, for, for sort of your normal person. And the Supreme Court really wanted to protect the idea that we would have free speech as long as there was sort of not a mob mentality that allowed people to, to have cooler heads, right? To allow the marketplace of ideas to happen. And um, in this case, I think, you know, clearly the mob remained uh, incited uh, and you had imminent lawless action. Um, and so the, the question really from a court perspective is, is, is was this imminent? Um, and the president has been very good over the course of four years of inciting groups and walking lines and winks and nods um, and dog whistles. And so uh, his speech, uh, as we heard in the Senate today, and we will hear for the coming days, really walked that line. The second case, which I'll get into, I think a little bit later, is the Skokie case, which is the, the focus of my uh, fellowship, which is uh, where you had uh, members of the American Nazi party wanting to march through Skokie, Illinois, suburb of Chicago, which had the highest percentage of Holocaust survivors uh, in the country. Uh, and again, this, the Supreme Court and the lower, lower federal courts stepped in to protect um, that speech, uh, didn't find it to be inciting. Uh, and then finally, when we're looking at it, we can't, we have to go back and think uh, th three years ago to the Unite the R Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. I always want to, you know, put that in context. I went to law school in Charlottesville. It's a college town, just like Santa Barbara, just like Santa Cruz. And so to have that number of extremists um, coming and marching through a town, challenging the community, uh, carrying torches, carrying guns, um, inciting violence uh, was really remarkable. And I think um, I encourage people to look and follow. Uh, there's some really cutting edge uh, litigation going on where they're using message boards and electronic messages to show that there actually was intent um, to incite violence, uh, which then resulted uh, in the death of a counter protester in Charlottesville and the, and the injury of many others. Um, so we're watching that fine line between uh, free speech and uh, what is not protected free speech, which is the imminent incitement of lawless action, uh, really be pushed consistently by these far right extremist groups um, walking to the edge and then often um, either in conspiracy or uh, sort of in a mob mentality crossing over. And it's a, um, it's a terrifying you know, a moment in our history. Uh, but I think it's something that not only should the Senate deal with, but we have to reckon with through uh, our the courts and jurisprudence. Wow, that's so insightful. Thank you, Ryan. Melissa, I wanna ask you the same question. Ryan really tackled it from a, um, some history and from the eyes of the law. I'm wondering from your personal experience and you know another way to look at this where, where is that the the lines between the free speech and the incitement of violence what what does that mean to you great thanks um well first of all i wanted to say i watched the 17 minute long video just before this earlier today that was being shown in the trial i don't know how many of you have seen it but it's 17 minutes showing what took place uh, through video footage of the speech that Trump had given right beforehand and then people marching, breaking into the Capitol. And one thing that I hadn't realized until I saw that 17 minute long video today is that so many people started marching while he was still speaking at the event. Somehow I didn't realize that, that, that people literally heard his 
his message and just left and went. Somehow I thought it was, you know, all the speakers were done, the event was over, and then people left. And for me personally, that just felt like one thing I hung on to in terms of thinking of incitement. In terms of my personal lived experience, um, in answer to that part of your question, there's a couple of things that I've been thinking about more along hate speech and free speech, not necessarily incitement, but thinking about the ways in which um, people engaged in acts of hate are able to use so often social media to kind of create copycat phenomena, like among mass shooters who engage in behavior and how difficult that can be to regulate. Like I was thinking earlier today about the mass shooting against two mosques in New Zealand that um, a shooter had engaged in. And Kachi and I were actually at the UC Free Speech Conference in DC where there was one of the head lawyers from Facebook talking about how hard it is to regulate that kind of bad activity, violent activity, hate-driven activity on social media and the ways in which uh, the person had live streamed the murder that he was on, the, the killing. And it immediately went all over the world on the internet. And I think 300 people managed to grab it and download it. And uh, Facebook said as hard as they tried to scrub it clean, get all of it you know, off the internet, off the world, uh, because there were those 300 original copies, people could still keep posting it, right? And so those were some of the things that I've been thinking about today as I've been watching some of the trial on TV in terms of you know, Trump's tweets. Um, everything in terms of not just what's said at the podium, but all of these five years, really. I'm calling it five since he announced he was running for office. And even as the insurrection was happening, the way he was tweeting, we're going to always remember this special day, something like that. You know, those tweets were going out. So I think for me, incitement is kind of um, thinking about the way all of these different factors played out. I think that's a really good point. I also think you know, I think there's a, a big opportunity to sort of understand, I think we all, um, and even the founders understood uh, the, a mob mentality, right, that, that overcomes the individual common sense or sense of restraint um, that in mobs, uh, and many of us have seen it up close, uh, you get an irrationality uh, and a pack mentality. And I think there's a really, to Melissa's point, I think there's a really interesting moment here to understand what role does technology play in that, in maintaining the mob uh, culture? You saw um, one of the defining characteristics in those videos is that uh, many people were taking selfies, live streaming um, the event. Uh, there was, uh, it was not only were people not hiding their um, <laughs> their faces as they enact, engaged in a crime, but they were actually promoting it um, and uh, and in using it to mobilize others. And so um, I think that there's a there's a big future to understand sort of where and how these technologies fit into to mobs and their reactions. Yeah, I was certainly struck because I saw that same video today, Melissa, just I started wondering how many people just kind of got swept up in the moment. You know, I, I truly believe there was, there were folks who were intent, like this is what they were gonna do. And I just wonder how many were like not expecting to go that far, but was just swept in with the crowd and everybody else is doing it. And I agree, I was really surprised on how many had left before the event was over. They were, their intent was there. Um, so I completely agree with you. It was really eye-opening seeing that footage. So I, um, it was really clear that it was both racism and anti-Semitism happening during the event, the January 6th event. Um, we also saw that uh, Black Lives Matter protesters in the summer of 2020 and how largely white insurrectionists received markedly different treatment by law enforcement. So there was, for me, definitely saw there's a difference between how law enforcement handled our Black Lives Matter um, protests in the summer versus when they were hand handling these, this situation, the January 6th uh, situation. Can you both talk about these issues? I'm, I'm gonna start with you, Ryan. You know, what, what did you see that's different? Sure, and uh, Katya, thank you for making that uh, observation. I think it's been 
uh, a stark uh, contrast for many of us to see the way different protests are treated. And this is a reminder that, um, you know, we sort of have the, these First Amendment protections. Um, they have never been applied equally uh, across, um, across race or political ideologies or other approaches. But also, um, you know, there is the idea in law of the chilling effect. And so, um, so while Black Lives Matter or counter protesters to Donald Trump um, in Lafayette Square had, um, uh, may have had a right to engage in protest, when you are confronted with a militarized police response, um, it may not, uh, you may not be able to engage in your rights, even, even though uh, they are protected just by fear, intimidation, uh, and the very real threat that that can sometimes pose. Um, I do wanna um, talk a little bit about anti-Semitism also, which you brought up. Um, and I think uh, I have a, a, a photo that hopefully can be shown uh, of the unite the of the unite the right rally in Charlottesville, uh, where you see uh, Nazi ideology uh, mixed in with Confederate um, uh, uh, flags and symbols. Um, you have uh, in 2020 the highest percentage of assaults, vandalism, and harassment uh, of Jews uh, since the Anti Defamation League began tracking them in the early 19. 70s. Um, so we're seeing this, um, we're seeing it mix into the ideology uh, in also the chance, uh, the approaches, um, and how it's gone forward. And then if you move to the next uh, photo, we have uh, uh, at least uh, one of the protesters wearing a Camp Auschwitz uh, um, sweatshirt. Uh, and so you saw it also being mobilized uh, through the conspiracy theories that may have driven a number of the protesters, but also, you know, in the outward signs. Um, and it's driving, I think, um, this is not a new phenomenon, obviously, but it's, but it is uh, emerging stronger uh, across the country. And you're seeing, you know, um, I, th I think, in addition to uh, different minority groups, uh, feeling harassed, threatened, and we saw uh, the, the January 6th um, insurrectionists engaging in uh, race-based attacks in the days uh, leading up to the, the insurrection uh, around Washington, DC. Um, and then you're also seeing uh, anti-Semitic uh, activity being baked into these movements as well. Thank you. Melissa, what are your observations? Great. Well. Just to echo what Ryan said, while we have, you know, freedom of speech, the actual ability to exercise freedom of assembly is imbued with power relations, right? Minoritized populations have benefited from the First Amendment, but never to the same extent that it protects whites. So an example I would use of that that might be historical, but also fresh in people's minds is when uh, civil rights icon and longtime political amazing figure John Lewis uh, passed away. Our students might remember seeing on the news and elsewhere different, um, you know, video footage of thanking him for all his service, his um, work as an activist, but specifically showing him being beaten on the head by police during what became known as Bloody Sunday in 1965 in Selma, Alabama, when he was only 25 years old. And he led 600 marchers across the bridge, which was named after a Confederate soldier and um, politician, by the way. But um, they were attacked by troopers when they were just trying to demonstrate for Black voting rights and to be able to talk to the governor at the time because there had been the uh, police killing, the shooting of another one of the civil rights activists, a black man, right? And so thinking about that time period, we know that there is this history, right? And so then thinking in our current moment, definitely at the Capitol, it seemed as though there was kind of this white impunity where whites felt like they didn't need masks for COVID, but they also didn't need masks to disguise their identity, right? I think we actually have a photo, yeah, right? Don't we? Okay. Yeah. So on the right here, there's a man carrying out the speaker's podium. He's smiling. He's waving. I believe uh, that even became like a meme or something. I remember seeing that 
going around on social media. And then on the left, there's police with batons raised hitting some um, protesters during the Black Lives Matter um, protests at Lafayette Park, if everyone remembers, that's where Trump ordered the local police and federal police to uh, push back the BLM protesters so he could cross the street and do a photo op by holding the Bible upside down in front of a burned out church. Maybe people remember that. And so, you know, there's such a, a stark contrast here between these two images. And um, the, the thing that really also I was thinking about during these um, really beatings at Lafayette Park was it was before the imposed curfew had even taken effect. It was like a half hour before. And so people are just, you know, peacefully gathered. And then all of a sudden, this violence was unleashed. And so um, that's definitely a strong juxtaposition. I would just very quickly say, we also know this from thinking about the way that the federal government, Trump used the uh, Department of Homeland Security to round up suspected protesters in Portland, Oregon, where they went around in those unmarked vans with um, uniforms, but they didn't have their names or say who they were. It was just like army fatigues, grabbing people, taking them to undisclosed locations and interrogating them to try and intimidate and stop that. I would say the Michigan state capitol, when we had the anti-mask protesters show up with their AR-15s as a big uh, sign of toxic masculinity or however you want to name it, to storm in while the legislature was voting on whether or not to continue to close down some businesses because of COVID. And they actually disrupted the Michigan state legislature from being able to finish those votes. And uh, they had, you know, AR-15s and were nose to nose with the police officers, uh, you know, spittle flying out of their mouths. And so um, a lot of counterterrorism experts are now saying that that was like a dress rehearsal for the Capitol takeover. The fact that they were able to do that and there were very, very few arrests. I think there were like six or something. I remembered reading very few arrests. Um, during that, it almost became a way to energize some of the um, more extremist elements and to plan this Capitol takeover. Um, I won't go into detail you know, about all of them, but, but I, I will just say by name, Kyle Rittenhouse, some of you may remember, 17 year old, Kenosha, Wisconsin shot two, well, three BLM protesters killing two and uh, the police didn't arrest him. He walked down the street with his arms up. BLM protesters said that was him, that was the shooter. But this 17 year old white um, kid was able to like get in his car, drive back home and was later arrested. And now I guess skipped bail. He also got out on $2 million bail. People raised money to uh, get him out of jail. So um, those are just some of the thoughts I have. Seeing the Capitol Police, some of them opening the barricades, letting people through was horrible and the selfies. But on the flip side, I will say, we also have to recognize we have a Capitol Police officer who was killed trying to defend the Capitol. We had over 140 Capitol Police officers who were injured. We've had at least two, I think maybe three police officers who have committed suicide after this happened, you know, the trauma and the experience of that. So, uh, and I will even add like also the people who are having their lives ruined because they believed our president, they were sold on this big lie of the steal of the election and the woman who also died um, defending what she thought was children from QAnon, you know, and these conspiracy theories. And so really when we think about the casualty, uh, it really spreads across a lot of different groups. Yeah, thank you, for thank you for that, Melissa. I'm really appreciating how you are both helping me with a timeline and understanding how things connect and where we got to, where we are today, how we got here. Um, Ryan, I wanna hear more about your work with uh, UC, the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement um, with your focus on the infamous 1978 case in Skokie, Illinois. Um, this is the case in which neo-Nazis planned a demonstration in an enclave in, inhibited by Holocaust survivors. Can you tell us more about that and what you think the lessons learned are from that event to our current day? You need to know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for asking. It's been a fun project, um, if you can call it, this, if that's a good adjective, uh, to look into this case uh, nearly 50 years later and try to understand its impact. Um, so uh, in Skokie, Illinois, you had the highest percentage of 
Holocaust survivors and actually concentration camp survivors uh, in the United States. Uh, nearly 6,000 out of the roughly uh, 60,000 people uh, in the community. Um, and you had uh, Frank Collin, who was a uh, head of a local Nazi, Midwestern Nazi party, who uh, petitioned to uh, have a protest um, uh, based on anti-Semitism. Uh, he had been previously uh, attacking uh, communities of color that were trying to integrate um, some ethnic neighborhoods in Chicago itself. Um, and he sort of moved from Chicago and these, uh, these communities of color out to the suburbs and this Jewish community. Um, the interesting thing about this case, and it became a big worldwide phenomenon about the sort of limits of free speech when you talk about uh, decency and, you know, it basically with the intent of in creating trauma uh, for people who had already experienced one of the most traumatic events in history um, and uh, trying, you know, doing it while they were uh, alive and had tried to reestablish their lives. Um, the interesting thing about it um, from, I think, a, uh, that sort of applies to today and how we address all this is, um, you know, the ACLU lawyers who defended uh, Frank Collins' rights, um, uh, the judges um, by and large were Jewish and they were uh, the, a generation removed from the Holocaust and they believed, uh, and in fact, the head of the ACLU, the national ACLU was a Holocaust survivor himself. They believed the lesson of the Holocaust fundamentally was um, that you have to protect civil liberties at all costs because authoritarianism um, thrives in a world where you start, where you allow the silence of one, you eventually allow the silence of many. And so um, Collins defenders were uh, almost uniformly um, uh, Jewish with the exception of a, of a Catholic uh, ACLU volunteer, Barbara O'Toole, uh, who was from Chicago as well. Um, and they believe that to be the lesson of the, this major event. On the other side, you had this, uh, you had the community of Skokie, um, their advocates and allies, uh, who believe that the lesson of the Holocaust was that you have to confront and prevent this kind of speech, that when you have um, this uh, effort towards fascism, uh, that you have to sort of stand up and engage and never again and, and prevent that kind of speech from happening. So it's, I find it interesting that you have um, groups of people who went through the exact same historical experience uh, and drew two totally different lessons from it about uh, how to confront authoritarianism uh, and the role of free speech. Ultimately, um, uh, the ACLU and Colin were successful uh, in um, forcing the village of Skokie to, to march. A last minute compromise position allowed uh, Colin to, to instead protest at the federal plaza with nearly, I think there were a dozen Nazis and nearly 2000 police officers surrounding him, trying to keep the peace because there were uh, several, I think four or 5,000 counter protesters uh, uh, there. And, um, and the argument that uh, from the argument that the community had was that, that you know, they, they prevailed because they stopped this march, uh, this Nazi march from happening in their community and victimizing their community again. Uh, the argument of the ACLU is they prevailed because you allowed uh, protected uh, free speech. And now Skokie, Illinois is the home of the Illinois Holocaust Museum um, that was essentially created as a result of the speech with the idea of like the way to counter bad speeches with good speech. So um, as we see our authoritarian tendencies and issues emerge, um, and if you sort of carve out the idea that we're not gonna allow imminent incitement to violence and Im imminent lawless action, which is not protected free speech. But if you wanna think about how to confront it, the question becomes as a society, do we want more speech or less? Uh, what's the lesson to learn and what's the best way to confront it? Um, confront the very real challenges and lies that are, are spreading as Melissa said across um, both online and in the real world. Thank you, Ryan. That's super fascinating. I think about just locally um, the situations or, you know, when our students are protesting and or, you know, supporting whether it be candidates 
um, or there's different issues, different speakers on campus and navigating that situation and thinking about the more speech and trying to help students like, well, how can your voice be heard? What can you do to perhaps take away from something that's going on campus that you don't appreciate? Uh, Melissa and I certainly have gone through quite a few different events and speakers on campus that have been you know, really troubling for students of color. And so we have done everything we can to help support them in having their own events, detracting from what is going on maybe in another building. And, and that idea of more speech is helpful, but it's still hurtful. It's, it's still really hard. Um, but I like to hear how it can play out down the line. And what I am super proud of is helping develop our student leaders and how it has helped them along the way in terms of speaking up for themselves. So there is something about that as well. Um, I just want to let the audience know that we do see there are some questions. I have one more question for the both of them and then we'll answer some questions from the audience. Um, my next question for y'all, and um, we can start with Melissa this time. The current political climate seems untenable. How do we move forward as a nation and as a people? Moreover, moreover, how can we as educators model responsible citizenship for our students and encourage the exercise of free speech while at the same time confronting the very real dangers posed by white supremacy? Big question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've been thinking about this and I want to unpack the we when we say we as educators, you know, first I thought I'd start with me being trained as a historian, right, and thinking about how important it is to have conversations with students in the classroom around really difficult topics, around educating around power dynamics, privilege, race. When I think about my upbringing, my mom, she was um, born in uh, what was at the time uh, Nazi occupied territory, it was Poland, but then grew up in an orphanage in Germany because her parents both died from disease during World War II. And I just always remember she told me it wasn't until she was 10 and came to the United States that she had even heard of Hitler. She didn't even hear about Hitler in her books or anything she was being taught. And so there can be this way of like erasure, right, that I think is so problematic. I'm thinking about the fact that a lot of young people don't know about the Holocaust. They're not learning about the Holocaust. Um, I think that it's really important to not shy away from difficult subjects and also the parts of our history that are really horrendous as a nation, because I think that, that is very much how we move forward. I think as far as the free speech aspect of that, it can be students exercising their free speech in the classroom during those conversations, or it could be at events too. And as Ryan said, you know, frequently we say counter bad speech with good speech, have more speech. I think that uh, for me, as someone who's been a student activist as also and also a student employee, I've really learned a lot by trying to bridge student activists like myself and with the administration and understand how challenging it can be for administrators to have students understand it's not that you want a hateful speaker speaker on campus right but you're working within first amendment laws and policies as they apply to a university so doing alternative events has been really important for me i'll just let ryan uh answer your next question well, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, I'm so glad Melissa went first because uh, it's a very difficult question. Maybe the question of our, our times uh, of how we handle it. I will say, I mean, I've taught free speech at UC Santa Cruz, uh, a class on free speech at UC Santa Cruz for almost 15 years. Um, and by and large, I find the students much more willing um, to engage and wrestle and uh, embrace the challenges and dynamics um, and I also think, you know, I, th I think that's in part uh, because, uh, because they're committed and we create a space where we create some expectations around it. It's at a scale that allows um, people to, to, to engage with each other as human beings. Um, and so, uh, so in that way, I'm hopeful because I've seen it. And I think that there's a stereotype and a generalization out there about college students, but by and large, I haven't seen that uh, in evidence or in surveys 
of their attitudes towards free speech. I will say, um, you know, I think that uh, we've, uh, that both social media and our, and movements have um, given undue uh, attention to really marginal and extreme uh, movements. And, uh, and, you know, I think um, we've treated them uh, with a seriousness, frankly, quite frankly, they don't deserve. And by having people in, you know, engage and counter protest, um, that tends to elevate uh, and give these folks what they want. Um, the Unite the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville wanted a confrontation. They wanted blood in the streets. Um, if they had come, marched through town and left, uh, they wouldn't have gotten what they want. So I do think that there is a, um, I think all of us, there's a temptation to fight everything online, fight everything in the streets, fight everything all the time. But, um, but you may be playing into a strategy that, uh, uh, and an excuse to create more extreme movements or, you know, these sorts of insurrection events that, that we obviously don't want. I know in my experience, you really have to create the space for conversation. And that's not always easy to do, right? Because on social media, there are one bite sound bites and we are only seeing one thing. And so what I try to do, I teach a leadership class is spend one whole lecture doing an exercise where they're in dyads and they're defending something, whether they believe it or not. And I say, you have to defend it saying it's, you know, only good things about it. And, um, and the, their partner only has to only can listen. They can't interrupt. They can't ask questions. And then we flip and that, um, has been really an eye-opening experience. And then to walk through really, what is the first amendment? What, and then I try to end the conversation was, what is your ideal campus climate? What is your, what do you want your community to look like? And ultimately they get that, well, they don't wanna shut people down. They do want it to be a rich experience of a diverse, diverse ideas being shared. And so, you know, it's not such an easy thing to, add, to, to answer, but it's trying to provide the opportunity for them to have conversation and engage in what could it look like. It's hard as educators. I'm gonna ask a question from the audience. Um, Hillary, I know Hillary. She is currently reading the book Cast and she's fascinated to hear your take if either of you've read it um in context to the racial divide so anything about reading uh cast have you, either of you read it do you want to say something first ryan no you go ahead i haven't read it i have uh, a facebook friend who's a brilliant brilliant scholar from university of arizona who wrote a book called white guys on campus that i just love and uh his book was so important for me in writing um, the toolkit I did as a free speech fellow. And on Facebook, he had all kinds of critiques. Everyone said were really brilliant. And so I do know that there are some people whose work I really, really respect who have some problems with it, which actually is a great way to get me more interested in reading it and learning more about it. So um, th that's all I can say. Yeah, and I, I've read an excerpt, but I haven't read enough to, uh, to speak thoughtfully uh, on it. I do look forward to reading it. I really appreciate stories. And I learned a lot of history, just like this conversation and actually giving evidence and talking about um, the different events and issues and providing a story that goes with it. So I definitely think it's worth reading, certainly critique and interrogate like you should any book, um, but it's, I think a refreshing story of history. That's my opinion. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question. <sighs> Thank you for a very insightful discussion. Do the speakers think that hate speech in the US should be more tightly regulated as it is in many other democracies? Will that help in fighting extremism? So now we're asking for your opinion on free speech. Uh, Ryan, let's start with you this time. Sure. So, um, so I often tell my students that I believe 
uh, you know, in the way that we've seen obscenity uh, law really sort of fall away, essentially, um, and things that were once considered uh, obscene, whether it's rock and roll music or other things, um, are no longer up for debate and censored. Um, I, I believe that hate speech will transform in part because of the sensibility of a more diverse society uh, that, that we're experiencing. Um, and a changing set of values. Now, I think the interesting question is, so I, so I believe that, you know, and we, when I go to land in Canada or uh, New Zealand or Australia, I don't feel like I'm landing in an oppressive regime uh, and they've somehow managed to balance the idea of dignity and racial tolerance with free speech in a way that's doable. I think the hard part, um, going back to some of the conversations we've had is, you know, once you set a precedent uh, of a content-based regulation, um, you're allowing it. So, you know, uh, if you set something that uh, limits hate speech against one particular group, it's not hard to imagine a future Jeff Sessions attorney general applying that to hate speech against white, Christian, white Christians, right? Um, and once you've created a context where the government can pick and choose the content of speech, uh, I think you are heading in a, in a challenging direction. Other countries have done it, but it's not always easy. Great. What do you think, Melissa? I think your dog wants to engage in some speech. <laughs> um, so I am deeply conflicted when it comes to this question. And I think the more I think about it and the more time I spend in school, the more conflicted I get. I don't know if it's training from law school where you're always kind of devil's advocate and arguing back and forth. The reason I'm conflicted is I know so many scholars have said that once we start go down that path, like Ryan said, of regulating speech, we know it's usually the most marginalized who have their speech regulated, right? Just as we were talking about um, freedom of assembly and, you know, how protesters are being beaten, right? right? Like we know that these power relations um, impact, right? Who's the one speaking? And so on the one hand, uh, I am very worried that the more you regulate it, the more people in marginalized communities are going to be negatively impacted. I know in law school, I had a professor who was a lesbian. I'm a lesbian. It was a LGBT law program I did at University of Amsterdam um, over a summer. And she talked about how even in her city, she had drafted some ordinances to protect LGBTQ folks, but boom, it got turned. And then conservatives who were elected next used it against her. And she's like, people say that happens. It really does happen, right? And so th it, there's that. And then there's the fact that I don't think we spend enough time and energy thinking about disproportionate impact and the way that particular people are being affected by hate speech uh, differently, right? Even in the college environment. Um, for me, um, when Ben Shapiro came and wanted to speak against Black Lives Matter and student fees were being used for that on our campus, uh, friends of mine from Black Student Union who were very upset and talked to me about it. I'll be honest, like I didn't realize as much um, some of the critiques they were making about free speech and impact. I think that's a big thing we need to have dialogue about is you can read case law, you can go to all the schooling you want, but it's it's the impact, it's the lived experience, right? It's the fact of if you're one of only 4% of our campus population being black and uh, you're feeling as though you're being, she always said, looked at differently, treated differently in the wake of having someone like Ben Shapiro come to our campus. And, you know, even in social media, when we think about speech and behavior, we know it's our African-American students in particular who are more often targeted for online harassment when those uh, that speech activity happens. So what do you do? Do you create more policies and laws as, an, as a university, as a country? Or, you know, is it more about compassion and education and doing the work of transformative social justice? I, I just don't know. Yeah, it takes time. That's, that's the thing. And not everybody has time or uh, takes the time to learn more. And we need to do more understand, have more understanding of one another. I will say, um, uh, okay. just, just to, uh, to go off what Melissa said, I think one thing we do need to be careful of is uh, if we're going to have hate speech 
regulations, they need to be applied across society. The idea mm -hmm. that you would have one set of free speech rules on at UCSB and then you walk across the street yes. you're on State Street and you have an entirely different set of rules um, mm -hmm. is not a workable ex ex you know, experience. You need to have um, at least some basic understanding of where the lines are. Uh, otherwise you will have the unintended chilling effects uh, or these other impacts that that uh, unintended consequences that you may have. Yeah. Um, someone uh, wanted to push the question even further and ask, should domestic terrorism laws be enacted? If so, what might the impacts be on BIPOC and organizations like BLM? Any comments about that? I think it's a similar, I mean, there, so there are, there are domestic terrorism laws um, and um, they are, uh, as we've seen, they are, they have been unequally applied uh, across different activist groups uh, over time. I think, um, you know, uh, the question of, of who gets designated a terrorist is always um, a, yeah. uh, both a legal and a political uh, question. Um, and we just have to be, I, th I think you wanna, you, do, you don't wanna have insurrections. You don't wanna have people coming up and disrupting voting places. Uh, or legislatures or other places uh, holding assault rifles. I think that's pretty clear. That's not good for a, for a democracy. Um, but I think you wanna make sure that you have important checks on it so that it doesn't get abused uh, where essentially one group in power uses the tool to silence critics or uh, minority populations, uh, political or racial or otherwise populations. Do you want to add anything, Melissa? Sure. I was just reading an article, actually, it came out January 30th from the New York Times that is called How Trump's Focus on Antifa Distracted Attention Away from the Far Right. And it talks a little bit about domestic terrorism and the way in which, you know, it can be so politicized who we focus in on as defining in those groups. And so, you know, he really wanted to marshal resources away from a focus on far right conservatives, white supremacists and towards Antifa and Black Lives Matter, right? And so when we're thinking about the very first question of factors that may have played a role in what happened with the Capitol insurrection, I think that's actually part of it is the way in which um, it depends on who's in office. And for Trump, that was his base. He was not going to alienate his base by, um, trying to use the dragnet of the federal government to um, you know, have resources of money, but also labor uh, to, in the same way. So, so I do worry about the way that uh, expansions of domestic terrorism laws might impact other marginalized groups. So a quick example, if someone's interested in reading more about this, there's a brilliant law professor from Stanford University. I am forgetting her name right now, but Katya will remember I was, very eager to, to hope to bring her to UCSB. It's something I've wanted to do for years because she's brilliant. And I heard her give a lecture at San Francisco State, actually a keynote address. And so um, she has an article, I think it was a Michigan Law Review is where it's published, where uh, she has a whole section talking about the ways in which we have to be very careful because if we expand those definitions, it has been shown that they would likely be used specifically the case she looked at was Muslim student, uh, Muslim population, sorry, like Muslim American groups that were um, gathering during the Muslim ban to try and talk about like what could be done uh, to counter the Muslim ban and the way that there was surveillance. And so anyway, I'm not doing justice to how brilliant her piece is, but um, that's one person that comes to mind who people have given a lot of attention to her like thought process of, of what the, the traps could be in that. Yeah, that's, that's good to, I mean, we, we're, we tend to, I tend to think black and white because of what just happened and then some anti-Semitism in there, but you know, there's the, the immigration issue, Muslim issue, and it will affect different populations differently. So that's a really good point. Uh, another question, and this is good because we didn't talk a lot about social media, and this one says, I'm wondering about the difference in social media mobilization between left and right political groups. How has the far right 
been able to make use of sensationalism and shock tactics that the left has not. Who wants to start with that one? Do you want to start, Melissa? Anyone? Ryan, Ryan, you get to start. I'll start. So I think, I mean, I think, look, I think there's uh, the left has also used social media effectively to create some really amazing um, social movements. Um, and uh, and so I don't want to um, pretend it's a, you know, either or world. Um, I do think, uh, I mean, I think if you look at what QAnon does, essentially the gamification of a movement. Um, so by using the rules of, uh, of games where you have a quest and you have an obstacle, uh, you have heroes, um, they've really built this entire um, alternative world uh, that is very difficult to, um, to counteract. Um, it's very difficult to engage uh, in a rational way, but um, I think that's, that's an important phenomenon to understand. And then I think Melissa talked a lot about sort of uh, white grievance and uh, fear. And, um, you know, as you look at what social media, what's most viral, um, it tends to be uh, things that, that play on fear um, and play on extremism. And so um, the more that those are emphasized by the algorithms, the more those things are gonna spread uh, like wildfire. And so I think that's where the real challenge will come forward is how do you, how do, how do companies who are not bound by the first amendment, but are, you know, sort of the arbiter of free speech right now, um, where do they draw those lines and really what do they emphasize and what do they, um, what do they block and what do they promote through algorithms or not? It's almost as if you just keep saying it, it becomes so. That, yeah. That's the tactic that I would see. Just keep saying it, just keep saying it, just keep saying it. What's your opinion, Melissa? Yeah, actually, along those lines, I was reading an article, I think they call it the far right media echo chamber, right? It's this idea that, uh, like you said, if you keep saying it, you know, the election was stolen or whatever it is that's being said as though it's going to eventually become real. And so I think, you know, one of the big challenges is those rabbit holes that people find themselves going down, like, especially when we think about QAnon, I'll be honest, I didn't really know that much about QAnon. Um, I do enough like dark, horrible stuff that I study for my dissertation on mass shootings that like learning about QAnon was not exactly like on my free time list of things to do. But but to prepare for today, I was learning a little bit more about it, right? Like this idea, just in case this is helpful to people, right? That high level democratic politicians are running a global child sex trafficking operation. Um, the theme that the government exaggerated the pandemic, that the 2020 presidential election was rigged and the way that you get these disparate like conspiracy theories all stuck in together. I guess that's some of the brilliance people say of QAnon is they have an ability to be so uh, wide cast netting that somehow it's as though all of these disparate conspiracy theories kind of get brought in together with each other. And so for me, I kind of feel like maybe I'm wrong on this, but Trump and kind of a lot of the white supremacists engaging in social media online, QAnon, a lot of it to me feels like it stems back to Steve Bannon and Breitbart. Like I feel like so much of this has to do with groundwork that was laid so far in advance. And I hope I'm not going too far afield of the social media thing, but I think this is important. I just wanted to say, you know, some of the things I was reading, we're talking about even uh, with Mitt Romney and uh, John McCain and the GOP when before Trump arrived on the scene, right? So a while ago, there was a lot of concern, of course, about um, the fact that whites will be in the minority by 2045, right? And that the voting, the electorate's getting younger and more poor, more college students and more diverse, right? Especially Latinos and uh, the way that that has increased. And so part of the fear was, well, if we can't, increase the number of people voting, well, then what we need to do is convince everyone there's voter fraud and that, uh, you know, um, basically disenfranchising people and things like that, right? And so I think it's kind of important that we think like there's Trump and Trumpism, but there's also this kind of longer arc of what's going on is social media 
just play such a huge role in that and feeding into it. And I'll just say, you know, with uh, Black Lives Matter, Me Too movement, other groups that are also really doing amazing work with uh, social media, it's interesting how things have changed so much. I went to a talk where there was a woman, it was in Ferguson, actually, when I was um, in St. Louis for a history um, convention and it was, you know, after the uprisings in Ferguson. So some of the leaders um, from those groups were talking about, uh, it was an intergenerational like panel, an older person and a younger person. And the older person was saying, why do you give it all away? What you're gonna do and what your plans are on social media, you just put it out there and say, we're going to be at this corner at this time and you're letting all the police and everyone just know what's going to happen. And so it's very interesting to think about movements, speech and how it helps and hurts some of the causes. Well, I think um, I have another good question thinking about, you know, us as educators. How do we encourage young people in particular to seek reputable sources of information, this plays on what we were just talking about, and help them to identify misinformation and disinformation while at the same time advancing the ideas of free speech? What is the appropriate role of the university in that regard? Ryan, why don't I start with you? Yeah, um, so uh, again, a big question, but I think the big opportunity of our time, um, I can say this as a local government official, that the sort of uh, reduction of local news um, and then the move towards these forums on Nextdoor and Facebook and other things um, has made it in much more difficult to have a democratic process because we don't have a shared upon, we don't have agreed upon facts uh, and we don't have people sort of providing the context uh, and issues for us in the way that we did when I, you know, I, not that long ago when I first started on city council, there were three newspapers and uh, two uh, radio programs that would cover city council. Sometimes now there's no one there. Um, and that's an incredibly uh, dangerous situation to have democratic institutions operating without people paying attention to what's going on. Um, so I, I think from a local government point of view, from a university point of view, it's now sort of incumbent upon us to um, create uh, media. You know, I think it was easy for all of us to sort of send a press release or communicate through these um, different mediums. But now I think we have to create the mediums ourselves and engage uh, directly with people so that we can have some common agreed upon facts. And also, as you said, um, Katya, um, where we can engage with each other as human beings. Uh, if, if we're all um, so isolated behind our screens, it becomes very easy to demonize and um, attribute things to other people. And so I think we really need to think about sort of a digital commons uh, approach. Uh, because relying on the old systems as they disappear uh, is a is a dangerous uh, is a dangerous um, opportunity or dangerous incident. Agreed, Melissa. What are your thoughts? Well, I got to listen to a webinar where the executive director of the Free Speech Center interviewed our UC president, Michael Drake, and um, talked about the university and its role in misinformation and, and uh, you know, that type of thing. And so really, I'm just trying to cite my source, right, that this isn't just coming from me. But he was talking about the role of a, you know, Research One University in terms of being science data-driven, empirical, that the idea is that there is a truth, right? Like when we come to thinking about grappling with issues like COVID, we need to be thinking about science and facts and data and that there is an actual truth when it comes to those types of topics and issues. And I'm totally probably gonna paraphrase this wrong and probably people know, but what, what the actual quote was, but he was quoting someone else and I don't remember who it was, but something along the lines of you have a right to your opinions, but not your facts, right? And so we want to think about differentiating between an opinion and a fact. And I think that educators play a really important role in countering misinformation by actually helping students think about how to be critical thinkers of those sources that they're consuming, right? So thinking about what is your source what might be the bias that that source comes from, you know, is that not to say, um, how do I put it? 
not to say everything needs to be a peer reviewed journal article. That's not what I mean. I mean, is it a source that, you know, someone just made up and tries to make it sound convincing and it showed up on your Facebook feed? Like, I remember even friends of mine from law school when Hillary Clinton was running for president, they were sharing on their Facebook things about saying Hillary Clinton killed FBI investigator with her bare hands. And I'm like, what? You know, and it, it's like then years later, or maybe it wasn't that long, you find out, oh, Russia was actually putting a lot of uh, resources towards, uh, you know, influencing the election and putting misinformation out there. So it's not even how many, you know, years you spend studying things and degrees. It's, I think, balancing your emotional reaction, your emotionality, the cl clickbait symptom, uh, along with like, a deeper thoughtful reasoning of does this really make sense? I know I struggle with not getting emotional. Like, how do you believe that? But thinking about thoughtful questions and getting them to critically think, them being someone with misinformation or, or perpetuating um, poorly, poor ideas and you're wondering where they got them through. I've learned a lot from my high school, my high school teacher's son. He's really good at um, asking probing questions. And I've learned a lot from him. He's been quarantined in my house teaching high school. He's actually a school, at, a teacher at Berkeley High, high School. And um, I remember my nephew saying, well, I don't really trust mail-in ballots. And I was like, and I wanted to say, what? Why are you thinking? That's just because what that's what people are telling you. And instead I took a breath and I said, you know, well, why is that? Well, you know, it's documented that they, they don't count them. And I said, well, you know what? Why don't you use that little phone of yours and show me the evidence? And so he did, he spent time looking at it. And the article that he found was, there was a lot of ballots they didn't accept because maybe the signature was missing or whatever, but it wasn't that they lost the ballots. And that was a really good moment as opposed to me being just frustrated and upset with him and said, you know what, show me the evidence that they're just throwing away ballots. Let's just look at the facts and, and where you got that information. And that was a big aha moment for this 19 year old, I have to tell you. Um, should we look at the January 6th insurrection as an outlier? Or as, a symbol, or as symbolic of more serious and widespread authoritarian forces that threaten our democracy? That's a big question. So is this, a, this, is this an outlier? Is this gonna happen again? Or is this really showing us you know, what we should be expecting and some serious problems that we have? <laughs> Ryan, she um, was. No, I, uh, I think the answer, like most things, is somewhere in the middle. Um, I think it's an important indicator. Uh, I think it needs to be watched. And obviously, um, security needs to be enhanced. There needs to be a lot of other efforts. Um, I don't think we're heading um, towards a armed civil war in the streets um, yet. I think, uh, you know, one of the things I've been talking to some friends who sort of involved in local office and, you know, um, but for essentially three people in Arizona, Georgia and Wisconsin um, and decisions they made to make our election systems work, um, we likely would have had an, uh, a contested and sort of un undecidable election. Uh, we would have, uh, we would not have an audited uh, election in Georgia, uh, Arizona and Wisconsin may have gone the other way. And we would have a 269-269 vote um, <clears throat> uh, in the electoral college uh, and um, all hell breaking loose. Um, so, you know, I think we should recognize how close to the edge we got and then start building stronger systems and institutions to respond. I think one of the um, things that Trump most effectively exploited was a, an assumption that there would be norms that would sort of limit presidential behavior and not laws. Uh, and so he, he broke through norms on a seemingly uh, uh, you know, minute by minute basis. Uh, and I think we probably need to put laws and constructs in place uh, in order to better manage, uh, you know, whether it's social media, the executive branch, um, you know, uh, uh, all the different uh, potentially violent protests, I think we need, um, we need better systems in place and need, hopefully we'll see that emerge over the coming years. 
What do you think, Melissa? Yeah, I think that part of the way that Trump has been so adept at manipulating so many of our systems is that I personally think that it was never foreseen that you would have the people elect. We can we can challenge whether or not that happened, right? But the people elect someone who would be president who would kind of be a bad actor in the ways that he was. Some would say willfully trying to destroy the constitution essentially or exploit any, um, like Ryan said, any um, kind of uh, formalities or process of what normally would happen. And he kind of upended so much of that. And so I, I do think there's probably gotta be better um, checks and balances, better policies and laws coming out of this to uh, anticipate bad actors, to anticipate someone with authoritarian tendencies who's actually smarter and more uh, adept and educated in these matters, because I think that there is a real, po a real threat posed. And I, and I really think I agree with some people who have said the GOP in many ways is acting more like far extremist groups like in Turkey or other countries in terms of just um, being unwilling to accept election results and so much of what is taking place. So I think Trumpism is going to long last Trump the party and uh, I mean Trump, you know, on his hold of the party. And so those are some of my concerns. Great. Well, we only have a couple more minutes. Um, and so I want to ask a question, but I also want it to end with, so it's a two-parter, because <laughs> I want you to also think about something positive for us to leave with. Um, so the question is, um, what do you think is the proper role as educators in encouraging our students to seek out reputable sources of information so that they can be better citizens? So, you know, what advice do you have? to encourage our students to really thoughtfully look for the right, for, for reputable information. And then if you could end with, you know, what gives you hope or inspiration um, in terms of the public response to violence and hate? What, what, can we what can we leave this with in terms that's hopeful? Sure, I'll, so I'll say, you know, in my classes, I ask the students to go out and, um, and engage with media uh, thoughtfully and come back and, and sort of cite and do the work. I mean, the hard part is democracy and gaining knowledge and getting an education, um, it, it all is hard work. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, and it's uncomfortable at times. And so recognizing that going forward and then creating some expectations around it, I've seen people and my students, uh, you know, rise to the occasion. In terms of like what I'm hopeful for about is, you know, I think these kinds of conversations, right? Like we're having this conversation, you're seeing it ha happen in spaces all around the country. Um, and I think, you know, uh, it's, it's sometimes trite to have this idea that you have a marketplace of ideas or, you know, the way to fight bad speech is good speech. But there's also a truth, an underlying truth to that, um, that we've seen again and again. And this is an example, right? Like this is um, not only, I've been lucky enough to listen to, to you all ask uh, good comments and make good comments and ask good questions, but like, you know, we had hundreds of people uh, spending an hour and an hour and a half on a, uh, on, of one of their evenings thinking about these issues. And so I'm, you know, I'm optimistic that this has caused people to engage in a way that they they otherwise weren't, um, and hopefully that that builds a foundation moving forward. I um, read a book by Elizabeth Lesser, Cassandra Speaks, and I know Hillary's listening right now, and she's loved that book too. And one of the things she talks about in her book is to go to lunch with someone who has a different opinion, and you know, to do it safely in terms of you know, that you both are agreeing to listen to each other's side and actually engage in productive conversation and not about changing each other's mind, just in understanding. So I put that out there as a thought and I, I really appreciated that author's suggestion. What about you, Melissa? Yeah, I was 
going to say something kind of similar in terms of the value of community. So even when we're thinking about vetting sources and trying to decide if something's credible, I think what can be helpful to pull people out of those echo chambers is to get outside of it and talk to other people like, you know, is it could it be true that children are being smuggled in the cabinets of Wayfair, which was like part of the QAnon thing? It's like, no, like, you know, talk to other people, talk to an employee of Wayfair. I don't know, you know, like get outside your little clicking. And so, so, so getting outside oneself, being in community, I, and there's no shame in kind of being fooled by things that seem like they might be convincing online, right? Because they're intended to convince you or fool you. So I think part of that is the communication aspect. Definitely, it's not even just sources of like, oh, does that person have this credibility and they're at Harvard? It's not really that. I think even it's more of like, that's one person's perspective on the issue. What are other people's perspective on the issue who just have different lived experiences because lived experiences are so informative for whatever we're talking about, especially when it comes to free speech. And then lastly, what gives me hope is students, young people, activists. I mean, Amanda Gorman, uh, when she spoke at the um, inauguration, all I said was, wow, Amanda Gorman. And I think I have like 85 people like it or something. I felt so popular through her, right? Cause she's like amazing. And so like being in community in this really difficult space and finding those moments that do inspire us is, is really important. And students just inspire me so much all the time through their activism in person and virtual too. Well, thank you, Brian and Melissa, so much for this conversation. You pulled together so many threads of events and history that helped me make sense of what's going on. And reminded me to think critically on what I'm hearing, what I'm reading, and also to create space for healthy dialogue and to do my research. So thank you, thank you. Um, I know a lot of people are saying thank you on the Q&A. Um, and thank you, Maeve, for bringing us together and helping us have this delightful conversation. I encourage you all to keep talking about it have productive conversations. And unless Maeve's gonna come back on, I'm not sure, I'm gonna say, oh, there she is. <laughs> Do you wanna say goodnight? I just wanted to say a couple of words. I, I wanted to extend our thanks, our sincere thanks to Katya, Melissa, and Ryan um, for really a thoughtful and stimulating uh, contribution to this very important conversation. Uh, we also thank um, all. Let's see here. Um, all of all of our audience members as well. Uh, given the volatile nature of our current civic life, it seems reasonable to me to assume that we will be revisiting this topic in the near future. So I see this as the first of many such conversations. And in the meantime, we wish you all good health and safety. And thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. We ask you to please continue to wear your masks and to have a good night. And thank you again.